Imagine what it would be like not to be able to turn a doorknob or to wake up one day and no longer recognize the face that you see in the mirror. These are some of the stories that I'd like to share with you today, and more importantly, how 3D printing was used to help in these situations. Before I get right into it, allow me to introduce the technology of 3D printing a little bit first. So the image you see here is a stool. But what's really cool about this stool is that the whole piece has been printed in one fully functional part. So no assembly was required. All the hinges and working parts are printed together. This is a functional piece. It's a work of art because of its incredibly fluid, beautiful design. But most importantly, it's innovation. Now, those of you who've heard of 3D printing, chances are you know of it as a rapid prototyping technique. So the process of creating a model as a visual precursor to the real product. What I find really inspiring about Materialize is that our CEO was so visionary in how he saw the potential for this technology to just change the way we create. We visualize in three dimensions, so why not create in three dimensions? And mind you, this was 20 years ago that he had this vision. So what this has allowed is the opportunity to really innovate how we improve solutions, improve processes, and improve the quality of life. The image that you see here is that of a 3D printer, and it's building a part layer by layer. So it's taking two-dimensional information and creating a 3D object. Now, this poses a nice reverse analogy to a CT or MRI scanner that starts with a human body, a 3D object, and takes two-dimensional information. So what our medical applications do is essentially combine these two processes. I read somewhere that for technology to make sense, it has to touch lives. And I completely agree with this statement, which is why I went into biomedical engineering in the first place. Now, at Materialize, we have a team of clinical engineers who work very closely with surgeons to virtually plan their surgeries and design patient-specific solutions to achieve these plans in the OR. This young boy was unable to fully rotate his arm. And this is actually because of a three-dimensional rotational deformity, which is quite difficult to see on a 2D x-ray. So what we did was we got together with the surgeon and together created a virtual plan in a 3D environment and created patient-specific instruments to achieve this plan. A few months later, he was playing his guitar again. So who knows, maybe he's going to be a rock star someday. Now, this is an example of one of the more regular cases that we do on a day-to-day -day basis. But to really illustrate the concept of this technology, I'd like to talk to you about the most complex case we've done to date, which was also Belgium's first face transplant and the world's first digitally planned face transplant. Now, this case is presented by the University Hospital of Ghent. Professor Blondale and Professor Vermeij led a team of 68 surgical and medical staff for a period of three years to successfully complete this transplant. Now, I'm going to be speaking from the perspective of an engineer and the role that we played in this complex process. Patient selection is very, very important when it comes to a face transplant. You have to consider so many different factors, the psychology, the physiology, immunology, the ethics, and all of these factors are looked into in detail before deciding that a face transplant is really the best possible option for this patient. At the same time, donor selection is equally crucial. It is not just matching all of those factors that I've just mentioned, but also matching in terms of the anatomy, the skin color, texture, and of course, the family of the donor has to agree. Now, in keeping with that and uh, out of respect for the patient and the donor's privacy, I'm not going to be talking about their specific circumstances, but instead I'm just going to focus on how this process was performed. Now, when there is a, for every case, there's a surgical goal and there's a clinical goal. And of course, the patient has their expectations. From the engineering side, we also need to translate that into a technical goal that we can achieve. At Materialize, we have this concept from a book called Built to Last by Jim Collins. It's called The Big, Hairy, Audacious Goal, fondly referred to as the BHAG. So for every case, we have a BHAG. 
And for this case, what it does is it gives you a statement, a focus statement, something that we know we can achieve and we must achieve, at the same time pushes the boundaries of what you're doing. So it's audacious. This was the world's first digitally planned face transplant, and that was the role we were going to play. It was also hairy, it was a fairly high risk operation, and it was big. It was a big team of people working together, and it was a big deal to the patient. Now we started off, we knew that the patient suffered from very severe facial trauma and was stabilized by the first team of surgeons that worked on him, and there their sole purpose was to save his life. Now once it was decided that a face transplant was necessary, the first step of the process is to take a CT scan of the patient and reconstruct these axial slices of his skull to produce a 3D model. Now what you see here, again for patient privacy, we've not simulated the face of the patient, but instead you can see that the region between the eyebrows and the chin is where the facial trauma affected him the most. And what a 3D reconstruction allows is for the surgeon to, to assess the extent of the trauma. So here it was clear that it wasn't just the face and the subcutaneous tissue, but also the internal soft tissue, blood vessels, nerves, and the bony structure of the face. At this stage, a surgical plan is created. Now, this is basically where the surgeon says, this is what I want to do for this patient. And where we come in is to provide a virtual simulation of this. And this is the novel part of this surgery. This was the first time it was being digitally planned. So what we saw here was that the facial bony structure needed to be reconstructed uh, to the ideal shape. Now, there are two regions, the mid-face and the jaw or the mandible. For the jaw, we could see that the other side of the patient was virtually intact. So we mirrored it in our software, aligned the top, and what you see in blue is the gap that would fill, the missing region that would fill the gap. For the, for the mid face, it was a little bit more complicated because as you can see, the patient's mid face is completely missing. But luckily, the son of the patient so resembled his father that we were able to take a CT scan of his skull, reconstruct that, and use it as a comparison. So what you see in blue is actually the ideal shape of the graft based on the skull of the son aligned to his father. At this point, we have a goal of the surgery, to harvest and transplant the donor's face onto the patient. Now we're going to translate that into a BHAG for the technical side. So the first step is to harvest the ideal shape of the bone graft and then position that onto the patient so it fuses well for good acceptance. Now, as I explained before, the donor selection process is incredibly stringent. So what happens is the surgical plan is created, the teams do various cadaver labs to test out what was planned, that this is actually what they want to do, and the family of the patient and the patient are going through psychological uh, care, and they're all prepared for the surgery, and then they wait until a donor is found. So the three-year period, a large chunk of that is actually waiting for to find a donor. And once a donor is found, the family agrees, you have 24 hours to complete the phase transplantation for good outcome. And prior to this, we have no idea what the donor looks like, let alone what his skull looks like. So what we did to help simplify this process was 3D print the skull of the patient. This is not the exact model, but it's a similar model. The skull of the patient when it was in the shape where it should receive the ideal graph. So that is actually the image that you see there. And the 3D printed part, along with a 3D printed part of the mid face, which is the ideal shape of the graft, and the jaw, were provided to both teams working on the, on the patient and on the donor. So what this allowed was for the, each surgical team to perform mini fit tests as they were doing the surgery before they got together to work on the patient. And really, this allowed them to work independently and not have to run between ORs, which otherwise would not have been possible. What you see below are examples of cutting guides that we made for the surgery. Now, a guide is basically a 3D printed part, which is the negative of the patient's anatomy. And it fits in a specific location for a specific patient. Now, for the patient, we made some patient-specific cutting guides. But for the donor, because we didn't know what the donor was going to look like, we had to design a more generic solution that would fit on an approximate donor shape, which is a little bit more of a challenge for us. 
here you see the cutting guide that was designed for the donor placed on the jaw of the donor, and we're looking at it from behind the face. Now, the reason we call it a guide is because it guides the instrument of the surgeon. So here you see the saw being guided, and what this essentially allowed is to remove the correct length of graft required from the donor to position onto the patient. So at this point, with the help of 3D printing and virtual planning, the first step was completed. So the bone graft was harvested and transplanted onto the patient, and it, the fragments are being held here by Cynthia's plates. So the next step comes in, the hairy part. The nerves and the blood vessels need to be connected. So these were already harvested with the bone graft, and now they have to be connected to the uh, patient. With the help of 3D printing and virtual planning, the surgeons let us know that they were able to focus on what they needed to do here, which was working on the nerves and the blood vessels. They didn't need to worry about reshaping the geometry of the graft, which otherwise they may have had to do. The nerves here are the ones that innervate the facial muscles, so give you facial expression, as well as provide sense, so feeling to your face. And it's really at this point when you see the blood vessels connect and the blood start pulsating through that you know that this face has come alive. And so we move on to the final part. So we've completed the audacious step. So it's world first digitally planned face transplant. We've just finished that. And then with the help of that, we were able to uh, simplify the fusion of the nerves and the blood vessels. And finally, the face of the donor would be correctly and aesthetically removed and sutured onto the patient. And this really completed the big picture, and so it was that a culmination of all three aspects, the bony structure, the internal soft tissue, nerves, blood vessels, and the skin and subcutaneous tissue that completed the successful face transplantation. Here you see a post-op CT scan of the patient within a month of the surgery. And it's quite clear that the mid-face fits so well that it looks like it's really part of the same skull. The jaw is a little bit bigger, partly because the donor had teeth and the patient didn't, but otherwise the surgeons were very happy with the functional outcome because they were able to produce an anatomical reconstruction. This is a uh, small experiment that I did actually when I started preparing for the talk. So I stuck a piece of paper on the wall at work with the word face written on it, and I asked people to write the first word that came to mind. What you see here is a word cloud culmination of all the emotions that are brought about by the word face. And the, most of the things that you see are individuality, identity, personality, expression. And really, the face is the part of your body that people connect with, it is the part that makes you who you are. And so the surgical team, the patient, his family, they're so grateful to the donor and his family for the sacrifice that they made. I mean, you have 24 hours between donor identification and transplantation, which barely gives the family time to grieve the loss of their loved one, let alone come to terms with never seeing their face again. And so to that end, Jan de Kubber, who is an anaplastologist member of the team, took photographs and measurements of the donor's face immediately upon identification and created at the same time as the face transplant was going on, he went to his lab and created a model of the donor's face. And really, anaplastology is quite amazing in what it can resemble. And at the end of the surgery, this model was placed on the donor's body so the family of the donor could say goodbye properly and give him a decent burial. And for me, it was this final gesture that really sealed what was a technically clinically and emotionally challenging case as a true act of humanity with creativity, diligence, kindness, and gratitude. And at this moment, what I feel most strongly is gratitude. To be able to endeavor to use technology as it should be used, to touch lives. And on that note, I thank you.